All right, guys, welcome back to the study of Exodus. Here we are, lesson 37. Hard to believe we're plowing through Exodus 19 and 20. You know, a lot of people would say when you're studying uh, these two chapters, specifically even in 19, Exodus 19, 3, 4, 5, and 6, this is the heart of the Pentateuch. This is the heart of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's crazy enough. Yeah, we've just gone from the Abrahamic covenant where we see God's hand on Abraham. We see that through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God has an incredible plan, an incredible plan for his people. In Genesis 12, he tells Abram to go. I want you to go to a different land. But then in verse 2, he says, I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. I will be, and you will be a blessing. And then he continues on and he says, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with content. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So he reveals the Abrahamic covenant. And this Abrahamic covenant does not stop until the Messiah, Messiah comes back. But as the Abrahamic covenant continues on, God decides to interject another covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And so it's kind of fun to me. You're going to go from the Abrahamic to the Mosaic. And that's where Moses comes into play. Moses is being used as a deliverer for God's own people. And Moses... In this chapter, what I love about Warren Wiersbe says is that Moses begins to hear the voice of God even more clear. It's pretty cool. In Exodus 19, verse 1, Scripture says this, In the third month, on the same day of the month, that the Israelites had left the land of Egypt, they entered the wilderness of Sinai. And so here you have, again, remember Rephidim, we talked about that yesterday. Now here they are in Mount Sinai. They're, they're at the place that Moses is looking for. And they entered into the wilderness of Sinai, and it continues on in verse 2. It says, after they had de departed from Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Now, just so you guys know, like I have a family of six, four kids and my wife and I. Like to get to camping, you got to load up your car. <laughs> you got to bring certain food and you get the point six of us. Can you imagine two million people camping? So here they are. They're right in front of the mountain. And in verse three, this is what I would classify as the heart of the Pentateuch. Three, four, five, and six. Moses went up to the mountain. Scripture says, And the Lord called to him from the mountain. Now remember, we talked about hearing the voice of the Lord. He's, he's encountered him a couple times, but now it's like, it's starting to be clear. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. So I'm thinking, I'm up on a mountain. You want me to say this to all them? <laughs> Are they going to complain again? <laughs> you know, like that's just my natural thought. And so it's just kind of a fun process. And so he, he says, I want you to explain this. This is the same guy, you guys, who said I can't talk. This is the same guy who I have a, maybe he didn't say I have a speech impediment, but he's like, I can't talk in front of these people. And God's saying, I want you to now go and communicate this to everybody. In verse four, he says this, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. Okay, now this is what's so cool to me, okay? If you want to go to verse 5, Kevin, okay, as this thing begins to unfold, you're going to see three things that God shows them, really, uh, how God views them. This is the heart of the Pentateuch. In verse 5, it says, Now you will listen to me and carefully keep my covenant. You will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine. All right, we're going to go to another marker here. And what you have here is three things. This version, I actually don't like when it says it that. I don't know if you guys have another version on this, but it should say, not should, it's just another translation is what? Treasure. Yeah, special treasures. And so how God views his people is you will be my God's special treasure. Like God is saying, I have designated you out of all of these other possessions, out of all these other treasures, you're the special treasure. And God says, that's how I view you, Israel. So this Mosaic covenant that's being established with Moses, he's going to begin to, to, to unfold. Uh, Constable says uh, a couple things. It's a means for sanctification. It's, it's guidelines. Okay? The Mosaic covenant is also there for rules for living. You've got to remember, you guys, all of a sudden they're a people group in the middle of a wilderness. They're at a mountain, and it's like they've got to have some structure. <laughs> like, how am I going to follow you, God? What are my rules? What are my regulations? And then really even to the point where it serves as a, a redeemed people. Like, this is their outlet. And in Galatians 3.19, Kevin, if you'll go there, the Mosaic law was, was given because of, of this. Galatians 3, verse 19 says, Why then was the law given? Why was the Mosaic law implemented? It was added because of the transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. 
So the Mosaic law was instituted until the seed of Christ that was established, even that we talked about in the book of Genesis, until the Messiah came. This was in, uh, in effect until he came. So we needed something to serve as a guideline for, uh, for our sins. It's a pretty powerful verse. And the law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. So I just like to view this as a track. The Mosaic covenant is a track. Now here's what's crazy about this is it's a covenant we know for a limited period of time. But you also got to understand they now had a responsibility. The Israelites had a responsibility, as one commentator says, to fulfill what God's asking them to do in order to receive God's blessings. So it's conditional. If they don't do it, they don't receive the blessings. Now, let me try to spell that out even more because this Mosaic Covenant is like when you study this, it's so much. Picture a son. I love this image. Constable uses this image. You have a son, okay, and you say this. All right, son, if you do all of these family chores, you're going to get a bike. Well, what if the son doesn't do the chores? No bike. Does it mean that he stops being the son, though? No. And so the conditional part is, is he's not done with his people. They just miss out on what God has in store for them. In verse 6, here we go. I'm not done, though, he says. Not just a special treasure, not just my own possessions, but you will be my kingdom of priests as well. Wow. All right, so here we go. We're going to write this one. We are a kingdom of priests. So we're going to begin to unfold. How does this all work. Well, let's talk about this kingdom of priests language. First of all, this is the first time that you're going to see kingdom, as, a, as the commentator Durham says, kingdom is referring to God's rule through man on earth. But the way they're going to do this is as priests, not as politicians. That's the big difference here. One guy says the priest role is to stand between God and people. They are going to become a nation of mediators between God and and other nations. Think about that. If you, I love that image. Isn't Israel served? Don't you just view them as one big nation of a priest? <laughs> it's like everybody, you know, we're not going to go to that map right now. Everybody should start viewing them as a kingdom of priests. They should be the ones that are, are different. And here's how they're different. They're a serving nation, not a ruling nation. You with me? They're a serving nation, not a ruling nation. They're not led by political figures. They're, they're led by, by priests as mediators from God to man. Okay, number three, if you want to see this, and you will be my kingdom of priests and, says, my holy nation. So this is now God's holy nation. God's holy. This word holy means set apart. This word also means, uh, therefore, different. You're, you're, you're holy because you're, you're devoting yourselves to God and you're, you're separating yourselves from sin. You're separating yourselves from the things that would defile you. And you're now saying, I'm willing to obey the conditions that you have set before me. Hence the conditional covenant. Hence the conditional law. I am willing to say this is, and I am going to be set apart. Now, if you would, six, six times, you guys, six times in Leviticus, it says, be holy for I am holy. Makes me think of 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Peter is talking about this, this holy mindset. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. You yourselves as living stones are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ, Jesus Christ. Can we go to verse 9? In verse 9, then it also just says this, but you are chosen race, now Peter is talking, it's a different mindset, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I see very similar language in how God spoke to his Israelites. You are my special treasure. You are a kingdom of priests. And oh, by the way, you are a holy nation. I, if there's one thing I don't want you to forget, I want you to, to remember these three words. They're the heart of the Pentateuch. This is God's heart. Exodus 7, uh, 19, verse 7, after Moses came back, he summoned the elders of the people, and he set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded them. So all of a sudden, Moses has his speech. Hey, by the way, elders, this is what I'd like to tell you. Congratulations, you are God's special treasure. 
Congratulations, guys. You are a kingdom of priests. And then he says, oh, by the way, you are God's holy nation. He had his three talking points. It was done. And he said all of these words before them. Verse 8, then all the people, they responded, we will do all that the Lord has spoken. I got to be honest. I don't think they have a clue what they just said. But praise the Lord, God is gracious in all this. And so what he does is he sets it up with a procedure. So I'll explain this. So Moses brought the people's words back to the Lord. So there's this interaction. Moses is like, hey, God, they said they're all in. And so then all of a sudden, go to verse 9, okay? Then the Lord said to Moses, okay, you agree, I agree. Here's what we're going to do. <laughs> I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud. You got this, Moses? So that the people hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. So I'm going to give them a show and tell that's probably in incredible. I'm going to come down. They're going to hear what you, what you hear. So then Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. You know, I wrote this. I wish Moses had a, a Fitbit at that time. Do you know how many steps he got in? I mean, it was like elevation, huh? Elevation, huh? I'd be like, God, could you just tell me down here? <laughs> you know, kind of deal. And so he comes down and he, he says, so remote, then, then Moses reported the people's words to the Lord, right? So keep going, Kevin, if you can. And the Lord told Moses, go to the people. Here's the procedure. You guys have agreed to being a special treasure. You've agreed to being the kingdom of priests. You've agreed to being a holy nation. So now because of that, I need you to do something to start this process. I need you to go and I want them to consecrate them today and tomorrow. Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and they must <laughs> wash their clothes. I feel like they're talking to my children. I need you to go bathe. I need you to clean yourself, right? We're going to get into this. And be prepared, it says in verse 11, by the third day, for on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount, Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. All right, Kevin, go back to verse 10. So in order to be a central treasure, in order to be a kingdom of priests, in order to be a holy nation, I need you to consecrate yourselves. I need you to set yourself apart. Now, what I love about bathing and changing of clothes in the Old Testament, it always reflects a new beginning, always. There's a new beginning that's starting to take place. Now, please don't laugh at this, even though it might be funny. There's no Maytag. There's no washer or dryers. So when they say, go wash your clothes, it's not like, yep, just throw it in there. Like, it's actually kind of a big deal. 2 Samuel 12, verse 20. 2 Samuel 12, verse 20. Again, you have this mindset of changing. Then David got up from the ground. He washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, and went to the Lord's house and worshiped. Then he went home and requested something to eat. So they served him food and he ate. This was the time that David was turning back to the Lord. I like this picture. Um, I want to do this. I want to just bear with me as we sound this one out. Go to 2 Samuel 11. It's the David and Bathsheba stuff. David, uh, 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So here you have David, city of David. You know, that's where when we go today, that's where we would to, just to see this situation. And then if you would, I want you to go to verse 4 says, why was she bathing? She said, David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself, so she was taking a bath, purifying herself from her uncleanness, uncleanliness, cleanness, uncleanness. Afterwards, she returned home. There's something about taking a bath. There's something about new clothes, getting rid of and purifying yourself of the past. And when, when God says to Moses, I want you, I know that it says uh, in verse 10, it says, go to the people and consecrate themselves and wash their clothes. I know it doesn't say bathe, but sometimes you can imply that that is going to happen. If you're going to put on new clothes, sometimes it implies that you're going to take a bath. Not all the time, but man, if I, I'm going to walk into a new calling of a special treasure and a kingdom of priests and a holy name, I'm going to get ready. In fact, guys, you ready for this? This is a new shirt. I got myself a new shirt just for this message. Actually, somebody gave it to me, but it just seems to apply to this message today. So but who doesn't love to get new clothes? Who doesn't love to have a new start and take a bath or a shower? I don't know. I, I hope you all do. This morning. This morning. This morning. <laughs> all right, now watch this. In verse 12, okay, of Exodus 19, they're getting ready. By the way, okay, I want you to put boundaries for all the people all around the mountain and say, be careful that you don't go up on the mountain or touch its base. And anyone who touches the mountain will be put to death. You know the whole wet paint sign? 
This would be not a good time to try that. Don't touch the mountain. Oh! <laughs> or don't stick your tongue <laughs> to the bowl, you know. My mom did that when she was little, and it works. And, uh, like, I wouldn't try if this does or doesn't work. It's conditional. Everything. You get this? God sets boundaries. Don't screw it up, Israelites. Now, one of the commentators, yeah, it's kind of crazy. He said that there were bodyguards around the mountain. What do you think about that? Do you think? The reason I think that there could be is that, keep going, Kevin, in verse 13. It says that no hand may touch him, you know, the dead body. Instead, you know, or the person that's going to touch it. He, instead, he will be stoned or shot with arrows. Well, somebody's got to be shooting the arrows at the guy if he's getting ready to touch the mountain, right? Somebody gets to, Gets to throw the stones. Hey, go ahead. Anybody want to try it? <laughs> what was your job? Oh, I'm in the Old Testament. Really? Yeah, I was the guy who got to stone the people. Like, I mean, weird roles, but God put people in place to do these things. So uh, if you touch the mountain, no animal or man will live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up the mountain. My question is, is who's blowing the ram's horn? It doesn't say, but obviously God continues to put things in order uh, so that you do not touch the mountain until he tells you to do this. Strangely enough, uh, at this point, all the Israelites know God as a God that they can't touch. They view God as a God who has a fence mentality. You can't come near me. And what I think is interesting is when the Messiah comes, it's the complete opposite. When the Messiah comes, he comes flesh here on earth. In John 1, verse 14, you know, the Word became flesh. Now, and then it says, uh, the Word became flesh and took residence of, of among us. You don't have to stay away from him. In fact, he welcomes you to come to him. But in the Old Testament, the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law, there is a distance that you stay away from Yahweh, the Almighty God. Crazy enough, the Messiah continues to build uh, his realness by being here on earth. And in fact, Matthew 1, 23 describes him as Emmanuel. Uh, Matthew 1, 23, and it, it talks about God is with us. The mindset is totally different. And sometimes that's why I get Jewish people having a hard time turning to the Messiah. Because your mindset has always been, yes, God is holy, but I can't approach that God. The cool thing is, is that when Jesus came, he, he, re, uh, he instituted a, a new way to approach him, and that's through Christ. The, a new way to approach uh, God is through the death of Christ. It's not the ones that you can't touch. And so, in fact, the mindset should be, let us draw near to him, and then he will draw near to us, as it says in Hebrews 10. 19 through 25. In fact, Kevin, can you go to James 4, verse 5, just, just to reiterate. I want all of us to understand that no longer do we have a mountain in front of us. Uh, no longer do we have this mentality. That's the wrong verse that I gave you. It's close. James, it's right there, Kevin. Draw near. Is it James 5? Uh, uh, James 4, verse 8. Draw near to God. Verse 8, sorry. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. We don't have to play the distance games, but we've got a long ways to go in the Scriptures until we get to that point. Verse 14, Scripture just says this, And Moses came down from the mountain to the people and consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Remember, it took three days to do this. Remember this? So it's a process, you know, wash my clothes, got to let them dry, <laughs> got to take maybe a bath. And then verse 15, he said to the people, be prepared by the third day, do not have sexual relations with women. You know, I kind of thought, Lord, do I need to talk about this one? This seems kind of weird, like, okay, the whole bath, the whole washing clothes, but like, why do you have to write no sex? I think this is an interesting, I'm going to read a constable's um, quote on this. He says, there's a temporary halt on having sex. It seems to intend to impress the importance of this occasion on the Israelites and to help them con uh, concentrate on what God is doing. We should not interfere. Uh, we should not infer, hang on, let me say this again, that normal sexual relations is sinful. So God's not saying sex is bad. What he is saying is, I just need you to get your mind off of her and put your focus on me. 
I mean, that's as human as I can get it. 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Paul actually even talks about the whole sex stuff uh, and focusing on the Lord. <laughs> My wife and I talked about this. It's kind of an awkward conversation sometimes when you have this. It's like, hey, when can you have sex and when can you not have sex? According to 1 Corinthians 7, 5, do not deprive one another sexually except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come again together. Then come together again. Okay, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he says that in a season of prayer, Paul says this, you know, it might not be as good to have sex with your wife at that time because I want you to focus on me. Well, guess what? In the Old Testament, God says the same thing. And I have to be honest, never studied that one. And I'll be honest, never wanted to study that one. <laughs> but God, it's prayer. No, Kyle, it's conditional. Dear Lord. I, I don't know. I think that's easy for Paul to say. He was single. Yeah, I know. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm a praying guy. Don't have sex. You're not married, Paul. It's good, Rich. Good call. Anyway, I've never studied that before. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands, though, I'm not implying sex is, is sin. Uh, at this point, though, it seems as if this ab, uh, abstinence is for a, a, clean, a, clean, a cleanliness or a, um, a ritual cleansing, I guess is a better way of putting it. Uh, and so anyway, there you have it. Two, two restrictions. <laughs> a part of the Mosaic Covenant. Don't touch the mountain and don't touch your wife. Who would have thought that was a part of the Mosaic Covenant and the conditions? But I'm glad I'm in the New Testament. Verse 16, on the third day, when morning came, there was thunder and lightning. A third, remember, they had to get ready. They are now consecrated. They're ready. They're ready. Uh, their clothes are ready. A thick cloud on the mountain and a loud trumpet sound so that all the people in the camp shuddered. And it says even Moses freaked out. Kevin, can you go to Hebrews 12, verse 21? Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 21 says, even Moses shuddered. Hebrews 12, 21 just says this, that the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. <laughs> I love a guy who's honest. Verse 18, Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in a smoke, in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of furnace and the whole mountain shook violently. At the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and he went up. Again, Moses is back and forth and back and forth. But watch as this continues to build in verse 21. Then the Lord directed Moses, I want you to go down. <laughs> I'm so glad you came up. I want you to go back down. I want you to warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, many of them will die. Even the priests who came near the Lord, they must purify themselves or the Lord will break out in anger against them. My first thought is, who are the priests? So like, yeah, we're a kingdom of priests, but do you have a special group of priests? Aaron has, and his son haven't been instituted as priests. And so there's a couple different thoughts here. If you can go to Exodus 24, verse 5, what we can imply is that these priests probably are some young men that offered sacrifices before God. So it says he sent out young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. More than likely, they were probably the firstborns. Okay, more than likely right here, they're the young Israeli men and they are already offering up sacrifices. So it's already starting to happen. Scripture continues on in verse 23. Moses says, but Moses responded to the Lord, the people can't come up to Mount Sinai since you warned us, don't touch it, don't touch it. Put a boundary around the mountain and consider it holy. Verse 24, and the Lord replied, they're, they're having this banter back and forth. Go down and come back with Aaron. But, with the, but the priests and the people must not break through to come up to the Lord or he will break out in anger against them. And so there you have it. Moses went down to the people and he told them. And what you have really in Exodus 19 is it's a covenant that begins to take place. There's two types of covenants, okay? Back in those days, and I apologize if I'm not going to say these, the words correctly, I'm going to try. The, the first one would be a parity, a P-R-I-T-Y. This contract, this formal contract back then would have been between two equals. That would have been between Kevin and I making a deal. Okay, that's the first treaty. The second treaty, that's what we're talking about. The second covenant that we're talking about 
It's called, this is where I'm going to mess it up, Suzeranti. S, I'll write it down because I'm really going to botch this up. But it's, it's important because these people would have known this. S-U-Z-E-R-A-I-N-T-Y. And what this is, okay, is that this is a covenant between a sovereign and his subjects. Okay, so no longer are there equals. There's a hierarchy between the, the sovereign and his subjects. Rich, you want to try to pronounce that? You got any idea? Suzerainty. Ooh, that sounded... Legit, suzerainty, okay? What you're going to have here is, and I just want to do a quick summary. You're going to have a preamble anywhere in these suzerainty covenants, okay? You're going to have a preamble, as it says in verse 3. You're going to have a historical prologue in verse 4. You're going to have a statement of general principles in verse 5. You're going to have a consequences of obedience in verses 5 and 6. And then you're going to have consequences of disobedience, which we don't see here yet. Uh, that's omitted right now. And so what you're going to see is that this contract right here, this was totally normal to them. They would know that this is something that sounds legit. Now, crazy enough, in Exodus 20, this is where you have the famous of all chapters. And I'm not even going to read them all, but you have the Ten Commandments. God spoke all of these words, and He released the Ten Commandments. Now, crazy enough, I don't know if you know this, we'll get into this tomorrow. The Ten Commandments, there's a whole lot more than just ten. And in fact, this one guy, Marmandes, I don't even know, I didn't even say his name right. He's a Jewish philosopher during the 12th century. He wrote a book called Sefer Mitzvah, the Book of Commandments. And this is what the rabbis actually counted. And they still say today that not just 10 commandments, yes, those are the 10, but there are a total of 613 commandments that the Jewish people have to live by. 248 of these commandments are positive, 365 are negative. You guys remember the Israelites when they said, oh yeah, we're all in. <laughs> all 613, good luck. And what happens is, over the course of time, they begin to see, I can't keep this pace up. A deliverer needs to come in and pull them from this covenant to set them ultimately free. It's a cool picture. Just so you guys know, uh, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, they serve as a governing moral life. Then you also have the ceremonial or ordinances, which are governing religious life. And then you have the civil statutes, which are governing civil life. You have three different things that are going to fit into, yes, even these 613 commands. So it's not just the moral. There's also civil and there's also uh, ceremonial. It's a process. And guess what? Tomorrow, <laughs> we're going to go over them. We're going to go over some of these crazy things that actually make sense in that time. Thanks for jumping in with this, you guys. I know this is a lot. This is, this is a lot when you talk about the mosaic. Um, so thanks for being patient with me. Um, I just feel like I want to pray. Lord, I just pray that if there's anything that, uh, that doesn't bring clarity to mind, would you just remove it? If there's some things that I'm still learning that maybe uh, need to be cleaned up, would you just clean it up? Uh, and so, Lord, just thank you for ultimately Jesus taking care of all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks.